So we're talking about Jupiter, but I also want to talk about a comet. Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Uh, comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 was discovered by Carolyn and Eugene Shoemaker. Uh, the uh, 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 Eugene Shoemaker was a geologist that studied craters and asteroids and impacts. He and his wife uh, scanning the sky with uh, that telescope, taking photographs, looking for uh, various sort of asteroids. And along the way, they accidentally discover comets now and then. And so uh, when they discover a little fuzzy comet, they give it to an amateur astronomer, uh, David Levy, who uh, follows up on it and makes his own measurements. And so they jointly share the name Shoemaker-Levy uh, uh, with it. And so this was the ninth comet that they found. Now, what was unusual about it was that was the initial picture. Now, in those days, they were using uh, photographic plates. So these are, are, are glass plates that have chemicals on them that are exposed to light. So this is like film. And except it was on a glass plate. And so they'd accidentally exposed one of the glass plates. So off to one side was, was exposed, but they thought they could uh, use the other part. When they took the photograph, they got that, and they thought, well, that's light bleeding over and making just a weird sort of thing there. Except that that didn't seem to be the case because that's not the way light bleed over really exposes uh, on a photographic plate. And they developed one of the other plates that they had not exposed to anything and they did not get that marking on it. So that led them to believe maybe it was something weird. They'd never seen anything weird like that before. So they uh, said, well, what is this? So they contacted Kitt Peak National Observatory and they looked at it and realized, oh my gosh, that is a comet. It's like a squished comet in which the nucleus is broken into this long line of things. And then the Hubble telescope looked at it and saw that. And so the Hubble telescope again looked at it and they labeled each of these little subnuclei, A, B, C, D, and so forth here. Okay, now what happened? The comet was discovered in 1993, and uh, I was in graduate school at the time, and I remember uh, seeing uh, something show up on the internet about this weird comet that was announced that was in a quasi-orbit of Jupiter, uh, because it turned out that Jupiter's gravity had grabbed it. Instead of it flying through the solar system, it was in this weird sort of motion around Jupiter. And then they worked backwards and they realized that uh, one year earlier, it had passed right by Jupiter, very close to Jupiter, and Jupiter's gravity probably ripped it apart. Now, the interesting thing was, you know, after a little bit more study of the orbit of it, they realized it was going to crash into Jupiter the following year in 1994. And so, uh, and sure enough, in the summer of 1994, uh, it crashed into Jupiter. Now, the thing is, we have all these individual particles here, uh, the individual subnuclei, and they're all moving independently, but they're all in the same collision course. Jupiter was moving, and these things were moving, and so they're going to hit one after the another across Jupiter. And this was a huge, exciting sort of thing. Uh, the little observatory uh, we had at the university where I was, uh, I decided that we'd just dedicate, you know, like uh, for, this was, about, oh, this was happening over like a week and a half, we'd dedicate practically every night to observing Jupiter. And so we did. And so uh, that summer, uh, uh, we, we looked as we saw these things coming in, and uh, we were all excited. Um, and then uh, what happened was the very first impact happened, and uh, 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 particle A uh, 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 slammed into Jupiter. It wasn't visible for us. Uh, Jupiter was an evening object for us. It would rise actually during the daytime, set, you know, uh, a little after midnight or so, so only up in the evenings. And um, the first impact happened, um, and it was still in the afternoon 
for us in Texas, but uh, there was records from Europe and South Af and Africa where they saw it. Uh, South African Observatory posted online uh, pictures here, and this is before the World Wide Web, so you had to actually go to the website and download the pictures, but I knew how to do that, and so we saw the this big fireball coming out. Everybody was wondering what would happen. Now, the problem was that we had Jupiter, and then we had Earth, and the comet was actually hitting like this. So it was hitting on the back side of Jupiter, but Jupiter was rotating a little bit. And so uh, most people thought we wouldn't really see much of anything because it's going to hit on the back side. But as it hit, this giant fireball ripped out, and we could see that emerging from behind the edge of Jupiter right there. Okay, and so that, that, that was really exciting. So fragment A hit, and Europe and South uh, uh, and Africa saw it, and so fragment B happened uh, over Texas. And so we had our observatory set up. I had a photometer set going, measuring the brightness changes. Nothing. We saw nothing. Photometer recorded nothing. We couldn't find any evidence whatsoever of any impact. I was not alone. Fragment B impact was observed uh, in the infrared by McDonald Observatory, which would be far more sensitive than what we had. And so out in West Texas, and they showed absolutely nothing. Okay, so at first I thought maybe, you know, our, our poor equipment kept us from measuring anything, but they had really good equipment and they found nothing either. So fragment B was a complete dud. Uh, fragment C slammed into Jupiter and did something. And then finally, uh, we had some other impacts here, and, and as they hit, of course, these are impacts onto the, onto the planet, which heats it up. So in infrared, as it rotated, these big glowing spots. Okay. The biggest, one of the biggest fragments was fragment G. Uh, it was not visible impacting from us, but Australia saw it. And uh, reports are that some people in Australia said to the naked eye, they could see that Jupiter was getting brighter. And people in just binoculars or little bitty telescopes like department store telescopes, uh, uh, you know, Walmart type telescopes, they could actually see this giant fireball emerging from the side of Jupiter. And that was shocking. Okay. Because that fireball turned out to be actually bigger than the planet Earth. And, and, and so there, uh, 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 that evening, though, a few hours later, the sun set uh, for us here in Texas, and we could see this giant marking, this scar on Jupiter right there. Uh, in which we have sort of an inner part here and then an outer part. And again, the idea is the impact was like that and it, it hit and blew stuff here. Uh, so that, that's probably uh, the inner part of that dark marking is now superimposed on Earth. Just to give you an idea of the kind of impact scar that would leave. Now, granted, Earth is a solid object, whereas Jupiter is gaseous, and so you have this shock wave going through Jupiter. And so, but th this was still a startling sized impact for something so small as a fraction of a comet nucleus. Over the next several days, more of these impacts hit. Most, uh, not all of them, most of them left dark markings on Jupiter and uh, the, the circulation of Jupiter's atmosphere eventually shredded these markings. And, and a after a uh, 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 month or so, then uh, it was kind of interesting because you'd look at the telescope and instead of seeing uh, the dark markings on Jupiter, what you saw was simply a dark line running across Jupiter because uh, uh, it, it ripped it all apart and spread it around. And so there's, there's a picture of several of those dark markings there, all kind of in about the same latitude. Uh, uh, as Jupiter rotated, as these things hit, they didn't all hit in the same spot, but they all hit about the same latitude. So what's going on here? Well, what happens is we got Jupiter's atmosphere, and then we have cloud layers on Jupiter. 
And so we've got these different cloud layers. So we have a cloud layer, you know, like there, you know, we have another cloud layer like that. And then we get another cloud layer like that. And so the cloud layers are, are up here. And now remember that what happened was that the, uh, the nucleus of the comet had broken apart. Now, remember we had that, that probe that went to Jupiter and didn't really detect anything because it went through this really weird spot? Well, what happened is that the, uh, the, the, the impact would come in and blast into here. And as the impact came in, okay, then what would happen is that the impact would come in and some of them weren't well put together and they exploded here. Some of them punched down deeper in here, explosion happened, and then what it did was it blew stuff back up here and spread out above the cloud layers. Others went really, others of these went really deep in, explosion happened, blew stuff up and left it above the cloud layer. Okay, so, so the explosion blew stuff back up that impact channel to the atmosphere. And so this, uh, this one over here would be like impact B, which really did nothing for us. And then some of these others went to different levels. Now, the thing is that we didn't get much data about the layers of the clouds from the uh, uh, Galileo atmospheric probe, but we got a lot of data about layers of clouds from the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact because each one of the explosions was at different levels in the cloud layers and then was bringing stuff back up here uh, above and dropping it above the rest of the atmosphere, uh, above the rest of the clouds where we could spectroscopically analyze uh, do analysis of it. And so this was a spectacular probe. Because the comet was, some of these parts were probably rocky, some were icy, some were loose, some were solid, then we, it allowed us to probe to different levels. Those dark markings turned out to be basically due to sulfur from the uh, sulfur compounds, the ammonium hydrosulfide not the sulfur in the comet, but in the clouds. Some of these, these markings had a extra water vapor indicating it penetrated down to the water vapor level. And so we were able to penetrate and study the cloud layers indirectly using the comet. And that actually turned out to be all over the planet here. So it turned out to be a better measure than the atmospheric probe, which was really a spectacular sort of thing. Uh, again, this is infrared light here, and so you can see where the com where the impact happened. It was hot spots there because basically you superheated it by an impact. Okay. Galileo spacecraft was actually on the way to Jupiter when this happened and got a view kind of like from a side, and it actually got to see the impact site and see the the explosion happening on the dark hemisphere right there. And so it got kind of an eyewitness view. And then as the spacecraft continued heading that way, it ended up running into a kind of a cloud of dust debris kicked up by the comet. Again, close up from Galileo of Jupiter and the impact. We thought that was a one-shot one deal, but then in 2009, amateur astronomers were taking pictures of Jupiter and discovered, oh, wait, there's another dark spot there that looks just like those others. The uh, Hubble telescope confirms, yes, it is. It has got the same spectral uh, characteristics as those other impacts. Uh, and so there's another impact. And then another impact happened even later than that. And so it turns out that uh, we've actually seen several of these impacts. Uh, visual records going back for centuries have indicated that these dark markings sometimes appear on Jupiter and even on Saturn. And no one really thought anything of it, and a lot of professionals discounted it because amateur astronomers were recording these dark markings. Now we're realizing, oh, wait, these things are actually real. We're beginning to realize these gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn in particular, act as shields that protect the inner planets from comet impacts. If they were, those planets were not out there, 
Earth would be hit far more often by comets, and that would be devastating to the possibility of life on Earth. 